We are fortunate to have as our speaker today the immensely talented Paula Menelli. He has received critical acclaim both nationally and internationally for his socially conscious art. Currently, he is a master student in the Visual Arts Department at NU. And even early on in his career, he has shown vast potential. In 2013, he won gold and silver student jury awards for craft illustration and collateral design. He was also named Designer of the Year for City Press newspaper in 2015. His creative expertise and keen eye has led to various positions, um, such as comic illustrator, art director, and exhibition curator. Um, in the art scene in Port Elizabeth, Cape Town, and Johannesburg, he has contributed numerous installations and exhibitions. His most notable achievement is co-creating the District 6 Travelling Suitcases campaign, which received first place position in the Creative Circle out of the month, but even more impressive is when later on it received international recognition when it was shortlisted for the Khan Festival of Creativity in 2016. Without further ado, let me introduce Paula Manelli. Thank you. Um, I'm in a bit of a predicament here. Um, I, feels like, I feel like my mouth has never been this dry before in my life, and I don't know what it is. So, and I've been mixing like different, I mean, I was having tea earlier, and I don't know if that's what caused the dryness, but then I started drinking red wine, because I thought maybe like in your inebriated state, you don't get as dehydrated. But I don't want to drink water either, because I don't have to get up and go to the bathroom in the middle of this thing. So if, if anyone knows what I should be drinking to help me out with that situation, um, let me know. Um, can I just see by a show of hands, how many people here are neither employed by or registered with the university? One, two, three, four. Cool. You're employed by... Thanks for coming. That's really cool. That's, that's really cool. Um, thank you again, Marissa, for that introduction. Um, thank you, Derenique and Pedro, for putting this whole thing together. Thank you, Jonathan, for curating the space and organizing everything, like the chairs. And thank you, Andre Kiert, for making you a guinea pig in this seminar series, um, throwing me in the deep end so early on in the year. And um, also thank you to Mary Duca, who, who saw that I was visibly worried about doing this thing today. And when I asked her if she would mind giving me a pep talk, she responded by literally laughing in my face and then saying, it's your ass. So, great support all around. Um, okay. <clears throat> so, I'm gonna be talking about a few things today. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the politics of gender, race, performativity, the step-by-step -step process of mark making and private as well as institutional validation. And it sounds like a lot, but it isn't really. And the reason I need to touch on all of these things is because it took me a while to figure out how I was going to go about structuring this thing. And in the end, the only way I could do it without boring myself to death or trying to be something I'm not was to contextualize it within my practice and walk you through it from the beginning. Uh, now, I wish I could say I started with drawing lessons from my parents or some urgent need to express myself from a very young age, but the truth is I got into drawing when I was four or five because I was a pudgy kid and the only time I got any admiration from my classmates was when I drew them pictures of dinosaurs and cartoons. So I just kept drawing and drawing. But what nobody told me was that spending an inordinate amount of time on this stuff doesn't actually translate to popularity. And in fact, it turns out that spending days at a time alone and in a room doing voiceovers for made up characters actually just ends up making you socially awkward. So that didn't pan out as expected. But I wouldn't figure that out until much later, so I just kept drawing. And in the beginning, I was just redrawing cartoon characters. The majority of them were from America, but every now and then I'd come across these other weird kinds of cartoons that had, entirely different, had an entirely different ethos to most of what was on TV at the time. And everything about these shows was considered. The character design was amazing, so was the world building. And where the American stuff had, a focus on clumsy, bulky characters and conveying strength. 
This other thing, which I now know to be anime, was far more concerned with how these people carried themselves and whether or not they came across as cool. But what really shook everything up for me were comic books. Now, I'd already been making my own comics at that point, and I'd even occasionally pestered my mom into buying me some, but they were mostly just for anatomical references, and I never really thought that things that I made, never really thought about the things that I made as comics. Um, the work I made really just came as a result of me wanting to tell my own stories and being limited by the fact that I had nowhere near the amount of discipline required to pursue animation. So I was making comics, but I also had a slight contempt for them because everything I'd been exposed to at that point seemed hope, everything I'd exposed to in terms of comic books seemed hopelessly outdated in comparison to all of the other visual media I was consuming. Mm, one more. One, go one back. Cool. But then I found this issue of the spectacular Spider-Man at a magazine rack in CNA. This specific book was a really important moment for me because it showed me that not only could comics deliver on all of the things I was attracted to in other mediums, but I'd even go so far as to argue that it could do it in a far more elegant manner. I mean, to communicate grace, fluidity, and cool in a single panel with no sound or movement to rely on was such an insane proposition, and yet here it was. The art in this book was some of the most dynamic stuff I'd seen anywhere. The artist, Damien Scott, not only knew how to convey movement, but also pacing. He drew scenes from various dynamic angles, sometimes even having them in slow motion. And all of this while making you rethink everything you thought you knew about the human figure, while still somehow keeping it legible as one. So, after that, I spent the next seven or eight years of my childhood making comics on an on and off basis. And committing yourself to drawing a comic requires that you be able to draw everything. Ideally, a story shouldn't be compromised for lack of a necessary skill set. So this means as an artist, this means an artist has to be able to draw people, all kinds of people, people of every shape and size imaginable, exhibiting every emotion, every possible movement and gesture from every possible angle in any possible setting, with or without reference if need be. It's the sort of endeavor that can feel daunting if not approached with the understanding that what you're creating is not a replica of a world, but rather an impression of one. However, one more, I think. Cool. However, the one thing I wasn't thinking about at the time were the social political realities of these worlds, or my own for that matter. And it wasn't until a few people made remarks about how the work seemed white that I started to, that I started to think about my practice in that way. So back then I was just uncritically taking in whatever I thought looked cool from what I was exposed to. And it took a few people in some of my social circles to point out to me that none of the makers or characters in the work I was referencing at the time were black. And for a while, even after I was made aware of the fact, I just took it as a position of neutrality more than anything else. Not understanding at the time that there was no such thing really, and that the very posture of neutrality arises out of a comfort and investment in the status quo. So how could I really claim to prize style and individuality, or so the argument went, if my own work was unfolded through, or at the very least cognizant of all of the aspects of my own identity and positionality? From birth, we're socialized to unconsciously project our categories of identity at every juncture, not only with ourselves, but also with the rest of the world. According to the theory of performativity, that is. Performativity can be traced back to John Langshaw Austin in 1955 when he introduced the notion of speech act theory. Cool. He argued for the existence of what he called performative statements, statements that by their very enunciation constituted the acts they described. So an example of a performative statement would be the utterance, and now pronounced to you, married. Um, delivered by an ordained official during a wedding or ceremony, or I hereby sentence you to death, delivered by a judge to a defendant during the course of a murder trial. So Austin's speech act theory would later come to the attention of Jacques Derrida, Derrida, I don't know, if, if Jacques Derrida, who built on Austin's theory by positing that all means of communication rested on citationality. By this, he meant that the validity of all phrases and means of communication rested on whether or not they could be used in different contexts and still keep their meanings intact. So, to go back to the, wedding, the example of the wedding ceremony, it didn't matter whether or not 
um, the person presiding over the proceedings was really an ordained official or whether they were an actor playing the role of one. Because as long as all of the actors and audience recognized the custom or procedure being referenced or cited, then the performance was still a successfully executed one in the context of the purpose of that scene. So a person may be carrying out a performative gesture insincerely, but seeing as we can never suss out the true intentions of any center of communication anyway, that intention is irrelevant. And so the thread running through performatives is their citation of procedural norms. Later, Judith Butler, a seminal gender theorist and post-structure philosopher, built on Austin's concept and concurred with Derrida that the performative had implications for not just our relationships between language, for not just our relationships between language and the world were constructed, but for identities as well, and gender in particular. So she expanded the limits of the concept of, of performativity to not only encompass the verbal utterances that give gendered identities the illusion of legitimacy. So when after delivering a baby and the doctor says it's a boy or it's a girl, but to also include all of the various institutionalized rituals and customs that a person is subjected to from birth. So from the color of an infant's garb to the various mannerisms that they are taught are appropriate or inappropriate, she proposed that all of these practices and structures collude to gender one subjectivity, according to a binary system that serves to normalize heteronormativity. In her 1993 book, Bodies That Matter, Butler argues that performativity should not be understood as, quote, a singular or deliberate act, but rather as a reiterative and citational practice by which discourse produces the effects it names, unquote. So the recital of these gestures creates a loop which helps give the construction of gender the illusion of materiality, thereby naturalizing it. So it would be something like, you're a girl because you're wearing a dress, and you will wear a dress because you're a girl. So it's that reiteration where the thing being referenced becomes the, almost the reason for, for the existence of that construct in the, in the first place. So, however, this ongoing process of naturalization is just as reliant on the citations or references that fall outside of its sanctioned borders as it is on those that are within them. So, because whilst gendered roles and the char characteristics ascribed to the feminine and masculine subjugate women by portraying men as more rational and capable of the two sexes, that binary itself still exists to normalize heterosexuality by portraying queer people as deviants. So these people are identified as aberrations by their failure to adequately signify a prescribed gender. And more so, because those who successfully undergo this interpolation are not regarded as exceptional, but rather completely normal human beings, this means that those whose identities deviate from this norm have their very humanity denied. There can be no normalcy without that which is judged to be abnormal. The latter exists to reinforce notions of what the former is not. Judith Butler called this feature of performativity the logic of repudiation. Cool. So it turns out that the very process through which society articulates which bodies are normal and therefore human is largely achieved by defining which ones are not. The lo this logic of repudiation can be said to be evident in the construct of race as well as that of gender and sex. In Race as a Kind of Speech Act, Louis F. Miron and Jonathan Ender posited, posit that the materiality of race is also constructed to, through performativity. And I quote, race does not refer to a pre-given subject. Rather, it works performatively to constitute the subject itself and only acquires a naturalized effect through repeated or reiterative naming of or reference to that subject. So whilst all racial identities are myths which only gain the illusion of materiality over time through the tireless reiteration of arbitrary practices and institutional affirmation, the, construct of, the construction of blackness stands apart as a body politic which is constructed not with the intention of normalizing blackness, but rather normalizing that which blackness is not. And there are a few places I can think of in South Africa that bring one's blackness, one's blackness into sharp relief in the way that Cape Town does. The short time I spent there was like <clears throat> easily the most traumatic period of my life. Um, but it was also by far the most educational. 
I learned, I learned more about how to look at the world critically in the two years that I spent there than in my years as an undergraduate here. Um, so while I was there, I began reading more and more texts that articulated experiences and feelings that I'd had, but had just dismissed as specific to me. And not only did they put to words what I was going through, but they also put, in the, put it in the context of much larger structures that I wasn't even aware of. So this is around 2014. So those of you who would have been paying attention back then will remember how fucking wild those days were. I mean, there was no shortage of public discourse on matters pertaining to identity politics. Op-eds were coming at you from every direction. And a lot of writers actually built their careers off of those thought pieces. And in Cape Town, all of that racial tension almost felt palpable. Well, it did feel palpable. Um, next. One back. Oh, OK, just leave it there then. So the place was always at pains to remind me that I was black which probably played a great role in getting me to start thinking about, how to craft, thinking about how to craft a visual identity that spoke to that. I wanted to create something that was not only grounded in blackness, but had a race as its first point of reference in how it saw the world. And by the time I got there, by the time I got there, there being Cape Town, I pretty much stopped reading comics, and I was looking at more single image illustrations, for lack of a better term. So things like editorial illustrations, posters, a lot of advertising campaigns, and even some murals. And I think the one thing that all of these had in common is that they were about leaving a strong impression with minimal effort on the part of the viewer. And whilst I now believe that the thing about art is that you have to meet it halfway, and that you have to make an effort to engage if you want to get anything out of it. I mean, the stuff I was making then was like, was like the Jehovah's Witnesses of visual art, you know? It would come to your street, knock on your door, but if you are white, instead of wanting to talk to you about our Lord and Savior Beyonce, it would just say something mildly uncomfortable or passive aggressive and then just leave. Uh, next. And how different was that from the public discussions we're having at the time though? Articles seem to come at you from nowhere, uh, make you and everyone around you incredibly upset be shared widely for a day or two, and then just never be heard from again. So somewhere in the middle of all of that, I started thinking of illustrations as visual essays. Because um, they're both about making persuasive, coherent arguments. And by then I had a pretty good grasp of what the conventions of visual language were, but it all felt incredibly Eurocentric. So I opted instead to come up with my own visual dialect. I and I began by looking at iconography that reiterated notions of blackness or South African indigeneity. And I kept coming back to geometric patterns. So I took one of the most prominent elements in those, the triangle, and used that as a scaffolding for all of my figure drawings. And that allowed me to be able to depict black people in such a way that you could always tell that it was them without even having to make their skin black. Uh, next. And next. Uh, This is supposed to be a GIF, but like I don't know how to animate GIFs on PowerPoint, so. So, there was no longer any question about whether the work was black or not, which is to be expected because the work was about representation, which is to say that it was about our collective presumptions about what blackness is. And it's not that I think there's anything wrong with work that aims to ameliorate the lives of marginalized people, but I do wonder about its limitations, if it's accessible to the point of not requiring any effort on behalf of the viewer which I have to acknowledge might be an unfair demand to make if your primary intended audience is black people in Cape Town. I mean, it just seems unfair to ask people to use their energy reserves to sit down and unpack a piece of art when you're in a city that is a site of unrelenting physical and psychic violence. Sadly, it's those exact kinds of spaces that give rise to the largest proliferation of performativities of blackness. In 2003, speaking at a black manager's forum conference, then President Tabambeki said that a senior manager he'd spoken to said that South Africa's economy, <coughs> excuse me, said that South Africa's economy was split into two and likened it to a double story house with no connecting staircase. On the bottom floor were the poor who had no education, skills, or access to the abundance of resources that those in the upper level enjoyed, essentially trapping them in a life of poverty. Sorry. And a, and a cursory glance at some of the data regarding the distribution of wealth in South Africa. <clears throat> Sorry. 
might grant some validity to that analogy. According to a report conducted by Carter in May 1999, the Human Development Index set up by the United Nations for, for the black population in 1992. So the Human Development Index is basically a way of judging people's quality of life. So it, they, they, they saw that in 1992, the HDI, Human Development Index of, of black people in, in South Africa ranked closely to that of Swaziland or Lesotho, whilst that of the white populace ranked somewhere between those of Italy and Israel. And in an overview of South African income distribution between 1993 and 1998, Carter and May found that the levels of poverty amongst the majority of their participants had increased over that period. They also cautioned that unless radical changes were made over time to how the problem was being addressed, the poorer citizens could suffer the continuation of a form of economic apartheid. Sadly, we have in 2006, in a collation of several reports and studies on the shifts in South African poverty and income inequality, spanning from 1995 to 2001, Borat and Kanbir found that, according to numerous metrics, there was sufficient evidence to indicate that the income poverty had increased. Uh, and despite the passage of time, this inequality is still distributed along racial lines. So, <clears throat> in response to the comparison relayed by Tabombeki, Andre de Toit argues that the analogy of a double-story house, whilst a suggestive metaphor, it's an insufficient analysis of South African inequality as it simplifies the matter to an issue of inclusivity. Whereas, quote, often the problem is not that poor people have simply been excluded from particular institutions, resources, or larger processes, but that they've been included on inequitable or invidious terms. So, put differently, the conditions under which marginalized people have to operate within institutions are just as important as their inclusion within them. And this is true for cultural institutions as, as it is, this is as true for cultural institutions as it is for financial ones. So given that formal education at its various levels is likely to be the first point of contact with the visual arts for most black people, what are some of the conditions that black visual arts students in, in South Africa have to learn under? Zeroing, zeroing in on the role of teachers, on the role teachers play in this dynamic. Noana P. Lee writes that, Understanding teachers' dispositions towards racially diverse populations and how those dispositions shape expectations and treatment of students is a critical component in ensuring equality and equity. And, uh, and that having predominantly white teaching faculties can be detrimental to schools seeking to reverse rather than reproduce structural racism. And these conditions are of no less consequence in the professional visual arts field as they are in the educational one. Cultural critics have long recognized this and have noted that who appears on which side of the canvas, the desk, and the display case are ethical issues with profound consequences. And ultimately, performativity is as prevalent as the conditions that necessitate it. And if one considers what Crane Sudin and Hannah Botz, and if one concurs with Crane Sudin and Hannah Botz is that the self deciphers the self through available discourses, then what implications might this have for the possibility of genuine self-determination for black practitioners in the arts. Whoa. Go on. Cool. I didn't even, wow, I didn't even, okay, yeah. Uh, <coughs> is everyone still okay? Okay, cool. Because there's still like 10 more pages, and no, I'm kidding. Um, This orientation of one's practice in relation to whiteness should not be surprising considering that whiteness is hegemonic and that a hegemonic structure will always subsume all activities in relation to it, even those positioned against it. So, however, this solipsism is not, a function of, is not just a function of power, it is also a prerequisite for its existence, thus making it possible for the processes which serve to consolidate its power, i.e. the performativity of blackness, to also be the sites of its disjunction. Yo, guys, I'm still parched. <clears throat> so as a means of ameliorating these confining subject positions, Judith Butler implores us to invoke the positions, the IEDs, categories of identity, and simultaneously, provisionally, inject that which might make them more habitable thereby gradually calling the fixity or the materiality or validity of it into question 
thereby making it a site of contestation. However, according to Gobena Mercer, the burden of representation impedes this process for black visual artists. By charging black artists with the responsibility of speaking on behalf of the communities they come from, individual self-determination and experimentation are stifled, according to Mercer. Stepping back and diagnosing the problem in terms of structure, he argues that the burden of representation is, quote, constructed as an effect of the hierarchy of access to the institutional spaces of cultural production in the arts. The, solu the solution to this dilemma, though, is to address the structures which give rise to these conditions, not, not to regulate the work of a black artist according to their ability to, or desire to reflect entire communities back at themselves. In addition to the singularity and a keen critical self-awareness, the success of any studio practice even briefly embodying a transgressive performativity of blackness also hinges largely on failure. Failure to properly racialize one's practice. The failed reiteration or continuation or reference of these norms of the assigned category whilst still assertively staking claim to it, thus creating the fissures which allow for the influx of overlooked sites of blackness. The result, I believe, being one that affirms that in the words of critical race scholar Moya Lloyd, while performativity is inevitable, identity is always open and incomplete. So the last artists I want to look at today are people who, like me in my foundational years, are still very preoccupied with pushing the boundaries of what the human body can look like while still keeping it legible as one. Don't go, no, don't, that wasn't a thing. They've also created the worlds that these bodies inhabit, as well as their own unique visual dialects, founded on their own idiosyncratic tastes and understandings of the world. Artists like Ren Hang. Lisa Lomzi Piccoli. And one more, I think. And Rune Fusker. So thanks to them and the, theory I, and the theory I've been reading, I've realized that not only can drawing be approached as a vehicle to tell stories and as a means of putting forth an argument in the form of visual essays, thanks to them and the theory I've been reading, I've realized that not only can drawing be approached as a vehicle to tell stories and as a means of putting forth an argument in the form of visual essays, but it can also be approached as a reflection of one's thought processes. After spending a lot of time trying to hint at the kind of fluidity and uncertainty that come with the ever-increasing contradictory nature of my own personal belief these days, I've eventually circled back to line work. I think we often, I think we often project an assertiveness and certainty to line work because of how conclusive we feel it is, so I avoided it for the longest time. But one night after consecutive failed attempts at painting, I gained an entirely, completely, I gained a completely different perspective to drawing and uncertainty. That uncertainty isn't about inaction. It isn't a collection of doubts bleeding into each other. That instead, for me, is the result of a developed idea coming into contact with, independent, with other independent thoughts and perspectives. Sometimes running parallel to one another, at other times perpendicular, a mass of affirming and contradictory lines of thought that add up to a stance in flux, something that is ruptured, incoherent, and yet ultimately black. Thank you.